Hello, everyone, and welcome to our seventh FreeBSD Friday. I'm Deb Goodkin, and I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation. So I'd first like to let you know that you can find all the upcoming talks, as well as the recordings for the past talks on our website. And we'll post the link to that um, on our IRC channel. If you have any questions during this talk today, then go ahead and post your questions um, in that IRC channel and proceed to any questions with the queue so we know that those are questions because we do get um, people discussing things too in the IRC channel. So today our presentation is an introduction to hardware hacking on Raspberry Pi by Tom Jones, also known as TJ. And I'm excited about this talk today because I love playing with hardware and, um, and I got to take a tutorial from him, a similar one last year at EuroBSDCon. So let me tell you a little bit about TJ. He is a researcher at the University of Aberdeen where he works on network and transport protocols. And he tries his best to contribute changes and improvements from the IETF process back into FreeBSD. He is the founder, sorry, I was just making sure that you could still hear me. Um, he's the founder and the director of the 57th North Hack Lab, Aberdeen's Hackerspace. One of the many routes that dragged him into contributing to FreeBSD was the desire to port code for a hackerspace project from Linux on a Raspberry Pi to the much cooler FreeBSD operating system. From there, he was pulled into uh, kernel development. So he's previ previously presented tutorials and live streams on hardware hacking with FreeBSD, and he's proud to introduce FreeBSD and Raspberry Pi through our FreeBSD Friday series. One more thing I wanted to point out was uh, TJ just posted a bugathon that he's going to be running. It's the second virtual bugathon, and it's going to be held on September 19th, starting at 1400 UTC. So make sure you um, follow our webpage as well as his Twitter account to, um, to find out more about that. So now I'll hand this off to TJ. Ah, see, it said share audio, but it didn't unmute me. Uh, th th thanks for the introduction, Deb. Um, and so this is a this is an introduction to, to FreeBSD with the, the Raspberry Pi. And I, I think a great vehicle for this is to do some, some hardware stuff um, because I, I, I love playing with um, physical things. And it is great to take the experience we get using computers in a, in a more virtual world and, and make something really happen. And there's nothing more satisfying than, than turning an LED on and off. Um, and why, while from an outside perspective, it doesn't sound like a lot, it is, uh, it's always very satisfying. It was very satisfying today when I when I made sure all my examples still work. Um, and so it's a great thing. And so we're gonna I'm gonna give a an introduction to FreeBSD, an introduction to the the Raspberry Pi, and then we'll just walk through two very small examples: um, turning an LED on and off, and uh, reading an input from from a button. Uh, and I'm gonna do this using a, a Raspberry Pi. And so that, that's how it all comes together. So because I, I hope that this, vid this video will get a lot of reach uh, even after the stream, uh, I'm going to do an introduction to FreeBSD and, and the Raspberry Pi. And so FreeBSD is a free Unix-like operating system. It is descended from the, the Berkeley software distribution Unix from um, all the way through from the, the 70s and 80s to, to today. Uh, and it is a, a great consistent platform. And it runs from the, the most powerful uh, network servers in the world, delivering 30% you know, of the, the internet's traffic. Um, through high performance specialized devices like routers and, and firewalls uh, and network servers, uh, through laptops and home PCs. And I run FreeBSD on, a, on my own laptop and on desktops all the time, down to really small credit card sized devices like the, like the Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi is what we're going to talk about today. FreeBSD has a, a ton of great and unique features, and they've been covered partially in, in some of the previous streams, and I'm sure they'll be covered in more of the streams. And uh, if you're in the IRC channel and you just want to know more about FreeBSD, I'm sure someone will, will offer you a favorite feature if, if you just ask. Um, FreeBSD is uh, distinct really from what you get with, with Linux in that you get a complete operating system image. Um, this means that rather than how things are in Linux where there is a Linux kernel and then there is a, a GNU or other user space and there are other tools put together by a distributor in the form of a distribution, um, FreeBSD gives you the entire operating system. 
Um, and this is really important when it comes to single board computers because a lot of single board computers don't run the mainline um, the mainline distributions. They run a fork from the board's vendor because the hardware, especially in the ARM world, uh, is very specialized and it hasn't had great auto discovery. It is getting better, but it hasn't had great auto discovery. And so you needed a particular image for a particular board. And what we ended up with was uh, most of the Linux distributions refused to support these things. And, and instead, what they did is uh, they would be, they'd be forks. And so the Raspberry Pi is a great example of this. Um, they're now starting to work around it, but they've had Raspbian, their, their distribution of Debian. Um, and what that means is that things that are in Raspbian aren't in Debian, and things that are in Debian aren't in Raspbian. Whereas with FreeBSD, we have a, a single image that we, we build. And basically, I mean, hardware aside, and maybe some tools, um, the FreeBSD you install on a laptop is the FreeBSD you install on the Raspberry Pi. And you know, apart from maybe memory issues, anything you can do on, on a, on a full-size computer, um, on, a, on a giant computer, you can also do it on a Raspberry Pi. And obviously, you get um, you know, scales of power from this. The Raspberry Pi is a, a family of single board computers, or SBCs, um, built around a, a system on a chip from Broadcom. It's a, a project that came out of the, the University of Cambridge, and it was intended as a, a way to uh, expose uh, university students and primary and secondary age students um, to hardware. Um, but it, it's turned into a great vehicle for all sorts of education. And it, the intention when they set out was to make something very cheap. Um, the system on a chip, the original Raspberry Pis were built around, is basically just a really big video core with a little ARM core strapped to the side. And, and since the boards first shipped in 2012, that has sort of diminished a bit because video has gotten more powerful. Um, they, these, are, these are great little things. Um, the, the introductory slide, so the front slide with the Pis on it, has um, a Raspberry Pi 3, which we're going to use today. And it has a Raspberry Pi 0, which is propping up the Pi 3. You can't see. And it also has my uh, 2012, uh, sorry, my uh, Raspberry Pi B Model B that I got in 2012 with a 2011 copyright. And this Raspberry Pi is still going. So I used it earlier this year to do um, interstitial slides for uh, a display on a black and white CCTV monitor. Um, and, and it was still going, and it was fine, and it was happy running FreeBSD and showing the ASCII art we put together. There are a lot of Raspberry Pis in the world. Um, they claim last year 30 million devices are, are out and about. So it might be that you just already have one and you've forgotten about it. I actually found the Raspberry Pi Zero uh, looking for an SD card yesterday. I was very surprised it was there. Uh, I, I had no inventory of it. Uh, so you might just have one. And if you just have one, you can. Okay, you need some more stuff to follow along today, but you could try FreeBSD on it on it today if you just have one in a drawer. All you need is the Raspberry Pi, an SD card, and a USB cable. The the hardware thing that the Raspberry Pi offers, which wasn't very common in 2010, especially, um, is it gives you lots of GPIO, and GPIO is what we're going to use to control uh, LEDs and to read inputs. Um, and what having a lot of GPIO means is that we have a lot of ways to interface physically with the real world. And so where normally we can just print stuff to a screen, um, say, from a shell script, now what we can do is cause a physical effect to happen from, from the computer. Uh, and with the GPIO, there is a standard enough connector. And uh, the Raspberry Pi has a standard called hats. So you put a hat on your Pi. Um, and, and these exist. Uh, and they have done a really good job, actually, of keeping this uh, pinout so that the place the electrical signals are consistent through, through all of the generations. Because the Raspberry Pi has been uh, sort of continuously supported as one family since um, 2012, there are a lot of models. And they have actually gone through uh, four different um, major uh, processor architectures with, with the Raspberry Pi. Um, and so FreeBSD support is different depending on the board. Uh, the original Raspberry Pi B, B+, plus, the 0 and the 0W, um, so the Pi 0 is the tiniest, cheapest one. Um, use uh, uh, our ARM v6 boards, and they're supported by FreeBSD ARM v6. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 2 is an ARM v7 board. I think there's some weirdness in its in its distribution of, of architectures beyond that, but I, I don't want to go into it. Uh, and then the Raspberry Pi 3, which I'm using today, and the Raspberry Pi 4, which uh, came out this year and is actually becoming quite a substantial computer, um, uses uh, ARCH64 and FreeBSD or, or ARM64. So it's a 64-bit image. Uh, as as I understand, FreeBSD is the major OS with 64-bit support for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, Raspbian ships 32-bit, and they're starting to change over right now. 
the FreeBSD project uh, produce um, SD card images, so something you can just copy to an SD card and then go. Uh, um, we produce them for our releases, so you can get these for uh, 11, 4, 12.1, uh, and 12.2 right now because we're in a beta cycle uh, and, and current. Uh, and so what I did to set up was I just pulled uh, the 12.1 image down. Most of the hardware on the Raspberry Pi is supported, but it's not necessarily in the way it's supported on Linux. And so when it comes to actually hardware, sometimes moving things between Linux to FreeBSD can be a bit hard. And, and unfortunately, we don't actually have support for, for Wi-Fi on the Raspberry Pi right now. Um, a lot of this is to do with how the, the Wi-Fi is rooted to the, the system on a chip internally. And it is being worked on. But if you really want this and you don't know what to do to help make this happen, you could always uh, give money to the FreeBSD Foundation. I'm sure they would uh, appreciate it. And, and they would know from your direction that this is something people were interested in. Um, and we're getting there. And, and of course, Raspberry Pi 4 came out this year. And support has been improving. And we're getting much closer to being able to produce uh, unified images with the 3 and 4. And so things should be painless in the, in the future. Uh, but right now, it's quite new hardware, and hardware takes time to support, and, and developer time is, al is always scarce. So I'm, I'm not going to go into depth into installing FreeBSD on the Raspberry Pi, because this is actually better served by other articles you could find online. Um, but, but overall, the, the process is to download one of the images. Uh, our images are produced XZ uh, compressed, so you need to decompress the image. And then you need to do a copy of the image onto an SD card. My preferred way to do this is with DD. And so an example DD command is, is on this slide. Um, DD is, uh, has got the other name as the disk destroyer. So it can be a bit risky to do this. And so there are uh, other guides. And the eLinux forum here where the easy setup uh, has some more stuff there. And it explains how you might do this from um, Windows. Uh, Mac OS and Linux are actually very similar to how you can do this from FreeBSD. There are also GUI tools for this. But I couldn't see if any of them supported pulling in FreeBSD. And, um, me me as, a, as, a, as a kernel hacker, I, I'm happy doing DD. I, I'm not going to wipe out my own file systems, touch wood. Um, and if I do, I'll do it on something I don't. I mean, I'll have good backups, so I'll be OK. Um, but this is the process. So you download an image. You remember to decompress it, which I forget to do quite a lot. And then you copy it to an SD card, and, and it should be good to go. It should really be this straightforward. And for some reason, this example, I used the Raspberry Pi 2 image. I don't know why. So with a lot of single board computers, connecting to them can be quite difficult because they don't have any sort of um, video out. They will just have a serial port. But the Raspberry Pi is intended to be used at home. And in 2010, really, when they were designing this, it was a, a really fair bet that everyone would have some sort of TV that could take a composite input. And so I think all of the Raspberry Pis, I'm not sure if the four still supports this, they have some form of uh, composite video output. Uh, there's not great resolution from this. but it, it works. Uh, I was using it earlier this year. Um, and it is available. And the later boards is available through a really weird uh, headphone jack adapter. Um, all the Raspberry Pis have HDMI. Some of the HDMI is a bit weird, but they all have HDMI. And they all have serial. Uh, with the Pi 3, they juggled the serial to make it really inconvenient to use. And so I'm not using serial today, because I want to give you the experience you get if you plug into your TV. Um, so setting up and installing and using FreeBase in the Raspberry Pi is, is quite straightforward. You connect your Raspberry Pi to the TV. You, you load up an SD card with FreeBSD, and you, and you turn it on. And after maybe 30 seconds, the board will, will come up, uh, and it will be ready to use, and you'll have a FreeBSD system there. And so it really is very straightforward. Uh, what you don't get is a graphical environment by default, but that, that's never stopped me, and I'm always quite happy. Uh, FreeBSD does support running X um, with accelerated frame buffers uh, on the Raspberry Pi. I've had Raspberry Pi push actually quite large numbers of pixels, not for video or anything, but uh, I had them driving like a 4K monitor, and they've been pretty happy with it. So they're, they, they are actually up to doing quite a lot of stuff. So today, I'm going to use um, doing hardware stuff as a lens to, to maybe play with FreeBSD and, and to play with, doing, um, play with the Raspberry Pi and hopefully get more people involved in doing hardware stuff, because we always need more hardware hackers, uh, no matter where we are. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the Raspberry Pi to control an LED, and we're going to use a Raspberry Pi to, to read from a button. And the first thing we'll do is we will uh, control an LED with the Raspberry Pi. And so here is a picture of the Raspberry Pi 3. It's sat right here. I'm putting my hand on it, but you don't have the video right now. And it's connected to a breadboard. The breadboard has an LED and a resistor and the button for later. Um, and, and that really is, is, is all we need today. We need sort of five things and a Raspberry Pi, and we'll have everything we need. Um, GPIO are our general purpose input outputs. 
they are interfaces that have been put on the, the processor by the designer, but without a specific application intended. Um, there's a, a recognition that there is a, a limit, limited amount of stuff that the processor designers can imagine. Uh, and many applications need um, IOs so they can turn things on and off um, or ways to interact with, with simple devices. And so if you think about any uh, blinking lights you've seen on anything from an uh, Ethernet switch to a laptop uh, fading light um, buttons, at some level, from a microcontroller all the way up to a processor, these are connected to a, a general purpose input output. A typical feature of GPIO are that they are reconfigurable. And so they're not just set up as an input or an output. There are cases where they only support one mode. Um, but the ones that will typically be broken out on the board um, are, are able to do both. And so the GPIO are there for us to use. And they're available on everything. Um, if you've ever set up anything like uh, APU2, there, there is a GPIO header there. I, don't, I wouldn't want to wire anything to it. I'd be too worried about killing a pretty expensive router. Uh, expensive in terms of, you know, like it's a lot more than $5 if you kill an APU2. Uh, so you'd be more sad about it. Um, and they're, they're, but GPIO are great. They're here for us to use. And the nice thing about the Raspberry Pi is you can spend $5 and get a uh, Pi Zero. And if you kill it, you've only lost $5. You've not really destroyed anything that's that particularly difficult to get or, or that expensive. And, and this is the goal, is uh, to have a nice, uh, pain-free way to, to experiment. GPIO on um, the Raspberry Pi uh, is quite well documented. And the nice thing about this giant maker community that, that came up around the, the Raspberry Pi is that there is really good documentation. And so this is a, a screenshot from a website called pinout.xyz. And it is an interactive explorer of GPIO. Um, and so if you click on something, so I clicked on GPIO 25 here, which is the one we're going to use for the LED, it will tell you um, where it physically is on the board, um, where it is in the Broadcom numbering sheet, because these are different things. Um, it has a wiring Pi example. Wiring Pi is a Python library for doing uh, Raspberry Pi hardware stuff. Um, and it, it, it describes lots of stuff. So pinout XYZ says where the power is on the board and where ground is. And we need to know where power and ground are so that we have the ability to power stuff. Uh, and it also tells you what the secondary functions are for things. And so when we're looking at GPIO on the board, we, we'd normally want to pick a GPIO which is unused. And so if you look at the 3v3, um, which is over on the left here, just below it, there's GPIO2. And it's marked as I2C1 SDA, which means it is the uh, second I2C bus on the Raspberry Pi, and it's the serial data line. Um, but there's already a user for that. And so it's maybe not something we should use. But if you look further down at GPIO 17, there's, there's nothing after it. And so that would be fair game for us to use. Um, 10 pin, 11th pin down from the top is GPIO 25. And that's what we're going to use for, for our LED. Because we're going to connect stuff to the, the Raspberry Pi and we're going to do hardware, uh, it is important that you know how to break things so you know what to not do. Um, <laughs> and so things typically break because there is too much power exposed to them. So there's too much energy there. There's more energy than, than can be handled. And if you have a Raspberry Pi in front of you and you look at that black blob uh, that says Broadcom on it, you'll see it's quite small. But the, the wiring inside it is even smaller. And so a very small amount of energy will, will kill these things. There's a great article linked here. I will figure out how to share the slide so you can click on it. Called, but it's called 10 Ways to Kill an Arduino. It's by a company that make a ruggedized Arduino, and they talk about different ways that you kill things. And it's a great set of examples for things that you could just do wrong by accident. But typically, what happens is uh, you create a short between power and ground. And there's a few ways to do this, and the article covers it really well. Um, and that will cause overheating and, and death for what you've connected to. And so I, I would recommend that while when I short power and ground on the Raspberry Pi or other single board computers, they just sort of turn off. Uh, I have a lot of these, um, and I wouldn't mind killing some of them because I get to throw them away. Uh, but for you, it might be the only one you have, and so you might be a bit sad. And so if you're going to try this, you need to be willing to to, to buy more things. Um, you don't want to connect the board to too much current or, or too high a voltage. Um, too much current is a bit hard to, to reason about, but too high a voltage is quite straightforward. It should be clear that you can't just connect this with some rusty wires uh, to a main socket because that will cause an explosion, or a car battery. That probably cause an explosion. Um, but you can actually expose it to 5 volts. And so one of the annoying things is at the, the top right of the, the pinout pin on, on pinout.xyz, you see there's a 5 volt line. Um, 
this five volt line um, is very easy to wire to the wrong thing. But thing would be okay. Um, the, the current one is harder. If you try and drive an LED and you don't have a resistor there, you're likely to draw too much current. If you're lucky, the LED will catch fire. If you're unlucky, something on the Raspberry Pi will catch fire. And if you're really unlucky, something will go pop. And there's nothing quite as uh, magical as the first time you let the magic smoke out of something, because it is a, a really great uh, audio visual um, sensory experience where you get this lovely smell of uh, something on fire that seconds ago was, was very useful and now is, is garbage. I'm going to connect things together using um, breadboards. Breadboards are basically uh, a set of holes, and then there's some nice grippy uh, strips of metal in there. Uh, the breadboard I'm using is connects uh, horizontally, so on the shorter edge, and you see with the flipped over image. Oh, it's red too. Cool. Um, it's the same color as what I'm using. Um, and they have a gap in the middle. And so anything you connect in a horizontal line on the left or the right side will be shorted together. And anything between them will allow you to make a circuit. And so we're going to make a circuit using a breadboard. Um, we're also going to use jumper wires. Uh, these are known as DuPont connectors. So they come in three forms. There's uh, a, a, a male to male end, which has uh, two metal bits, a, a male to female end, which has a, a hole, and then the other side has a metal bit, and female to female, which just has two holes. Female to female ends are quite good. When you have something like a Raspberry Pi, if you want to connect two of them together, you need female to female connectors. Uh, they're collectively known as a mess. You should segregate them. Uh, you should keep them in plastic bags, as I do, uh, but they will just clump together, and you'll never find anything you want, and they'll never have the colors you need. But yeah, they're great. Uh, the other components I'm going to use for this first one are an LED and a resistor. I have uh, very precisely picked the value of the resistor, and then I didn't have the right resistor, so I used what, what I found. Um, anything in a couple hundred ohms range will probably be OK. Um, what you're trying to do is limit the amount of current that goes through. And so we're going to make a very simple circuit here. And so I have a picture of a breadboard. We're going to connect to GPIO 25 uh, to the long leg of the LED. So the LEDs have two legs. Um, the fritzing diagram here uh, indicates the longer leg with the kink in it. Uh, the other leg of the LED we're going to put through a resistor. And this limits the amount of current that will pass through a circuit. And then we're going to connect it to ground. And so this is very easy, easy to connect together. Uh, and, it, and it shouldn't be a problem. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to connect to the, the Raspberry Pi. And we're going to have a poke around, and we're going to see what's there. And then we're going to try and turn this LED on and off. And so a, a helpful thing to do uh, at first is to just make sure that the GPIO controller is picked up. Because if it's not picked up, you end up with this weird cascade of things that don't work, and they don't really make sense. So this is a nice just check step. And so FreeBSD in the, in the device message will say there is a GPIO controller and, and where it is. Uh, and so here is an example of, uh, of me doing this. Um, and then FreeBSD ships with a tool called GPIO control. Uh, GPIO control uh, allows us to interface with GPIOs and configure how they work. And so if we run GPIO control um, dash L, uh, it will list all the GPIOs. And so if we just pull the first 10 lines from it, as I do here, it will tell us something about them. Annoyingly, the, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have any status LEDs. And so the tutorial I've taught before, we use the status LED first, because you don't have to wire anything. But while there are four status LEDs on the Raspberry Pi, none of them are, are in, our, in our reach, and so we can't use them. And so instead, we do have to wire something together. Um, and what we're going to do is connect an LED and resistor um, to GPIO 25, and we're going to use it. And so um, this first example here shows me uh, listing GPIO 25 to see how it is configured. And by default, the GPI this GPIO on Raspberry Pi is configured as an input. So it needs to be reconfigured as an output, which is what the next command does. And then we can turn the LED on. Um, all of these commands so far with GPIO control have done the dash F um, slash dev slash GPIO C0. This is actually the default GPIO device. And the Raspberry Pi only exposes one GPIO bus. Um, but other single board computers like the BeagleMan Black, the BeagleMan Black exposes four buses. And the NanoPi Neo LTS exposes two. And so sometimes you do need to be, need to be more precise. And so it's good to know that it is there. Because when you go off the default, it is a bit, a bit harder if you've never seen it. OK. And now we're going to do a demo, because that was words rather than actions. And so what I need to do is stop sharing my screen and share my screen again, because that makes sense. OK. So uh, I don't and now I need to remember to use the correct keyboard, and I have a hand. Um, 
so I have a, a Raspberry Pi 3 here. My hands are not in short. Here, which is the green thing. Uh, and it is connected to uh, a breadboard. The breadboard has a... The breadboard has a uh, an LED and a button. And so the final result we're going to get from the tutorial is that we have connected up the LED and the button. And when we press the button, the LED comes on. Um, and so we'll do these two steps, and then we'll have one shell script left to run. Uh, and so the first part for doing this is to disconnect everything, which might seem very bold, just to disconnect things. I'm going to leave one wire plugged in so I can remember where it is. Um, and so let's do the bits. And so if we run dmessage grep gpioc, we see that we, we have a GPIO controller on FreeBSD. Um, and if we do GPIOs, we'll see that it, as in the example, we get a, a listing of the pins and we get a listing of uh, all 50 out of the 53 of the pins, uh, 54, I guess, because it starts at zero. And it tells us what their, their configurations are. And so we care about um, pin 25. And so if we look at pin 25, we see that it is uh, configured as an output. And this is not what I said. I said it would by default be configured as an input. But uh, because I ran the script that blinked the LED, um, what it did is it, it configured the LED so it would actually be used. And it didn't unconfigure it, because I don't, I don't care that much about tidying up. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to, I, I will show you me configuring it as, a, as an output. So it's straightforward. It doesn't complain. And then what we need to do is we need to make the circuit. It really is this simple. Uh, and so we plug in the LED. So I have the long leg of the LED here uh, on the left of the screen. Um, the shorter leg, I'm going to connect to a resistor. So they go into the same horizontal slot like this. Move my hand. Other resistors are in the way. <laughs> so it goes into the same horizontal slot. Pin 25, which is the one I didn't unplug because I didn't want to have to count up to 10 again because it's hard to do that, gets plugged to the long leg of the LED. And then we connect the short leg of the resistor to one of the grounds. And I know there is a ground up here below the, the, the uh, five volt lines, because I've done this far too many times. And so what we can do now is we can run, and we can turn the LED on. And we can turn the LED off. If we don't give any argument, GPIO control will tell us what the, the logical level of the pin is right now. Um, and so I just set it up. Um, GPIO control really helpfully has a, a toggle flag, which will just invert it. So as I run this command over and over again, the LED will blink. And if I bring up this shell script, uh, and so I, I'll need to figure out how to share a link, but there is a, a, a repository on, on GitHub with all the shell scripts I'm using today, apart from the one I wrote today to do the lamp, uh, which I'll have to push that. And so what we could do is we can write a very simple shell script. It takes uh, two arguments, the bus and the pin, because this was written for something with multiple uh, bus support. Um, it configures the GPIO. And then forever, it toggles the GPIO, and then it sleeps. And so if we run this shell script, 0, 25, you'll see the LED blinking. And here, in real life, the LED is blinking in a very satisfactory way. Uh, but I can see in the camera capture that the LED is sort of fading in and out a bit. And that is actually to do with the, the, camera, the camera shutter. Uh, and so this is just a first example of, of the first part of what we're going to do. Now I have to remember to use the right keyboard. And we will leave this blinking. And I will come back. And I will do again present now. Uh, who knew demos would work? So I, I really insisted that you see the output of a GPIO uh, control list uh, so you can see what's there. Uh, and what GPIO control is doing is it's telling us um, things about the pins that we have set up. And so the first line of GPIO control here is pin 00. zero. And so pin 00, zero is, how, uh, is, is the pin number on the bus. And so a lot of these buses, they're basically just a block of memory. Uh, and there is like a word or two words for each GPIO. And one of them controls the current value, and the other one controls the configuration. And so they, they lay out really, really statically and straightforward. And they're quite 
simple. The next column in GPIO control is telling you the current logical state of the pin. That and this is the, the logical state rather than the electrical state. So we can actually have a pin where things are inverted uh, so that when you set it to one, it goes to zero, like it goes to a low voltage. And when you set it to zero, it goes to a high voltage. The next column tell is, is two things. So the first bit is the name of the pin. So this is how GPIO control knows what the pin is. And so for the first line, it's pin zero. And the next line, it's pin one. This is because the Raspberry Pi is remarkably boring, and uh, it doesn't have any names for stuff. Other single board computers will have um, actual names from the data sheet. So the NanoPi new LTS will have uh, PA11, which is the pin name you would get from the data sheet. And it comes up in GPI control. And this might be that these are not available, or whoever wrote this just didn't, couldn't be bothered doing it. The final thing in the angle brackets is the configuration of the pin. So pin 0 is uh, configured as an input right now. Um, pin 2 has no flags that the system is aware of. And pin 7 is configured as an output. And then pins 50 to 53 are configured as a pull-up. And we'll get into that just in the next bit. The, the meaning of the flags from GPIO control are documented in the GPIO man pages. And so the FreeBSD system has all the documentation for this. Another reason to, to love FreeBSD is it ships with good documentation. And it will tell you these different states. And so, yeah, I'll go to the next slide. OK, so the next half of what we want to set out to do is we want to read an input from a button. Um, and so reading from a button is, is basically the, the same thing we just set up, um, but it goes the opposite way around. So what we're going to do is we're going to wire a button, uh, and not a resistor, because I, I, I don't have one. Um, and we're going to wire up the button to the GPIO. One of the things I said in the, the, the things to not do is uh, to connect um, VCC to, to ground. And so there's some guides. So the Adafruit guides don't seem to care about this. So I, I, I've, uh, I've gone off it. Um, if I was giving you real hardware, I'd maybe tell you to be a bit safer. But I'm the one who's going to break anything. And I think we'll be OK. Um, what we can do with the button is we are going to configure it so that it acts as a, 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 as a high voltage. Um, when we press it, it will go low. Uh, and so this shouldn't mean that a power supply is connected to ground. But it might end up like this. But I, I don't think so. So what we're going to do is we're going to wire up the circuit. We're going to configure the GPIO. And then we're going to read the status from the button. Uh, so this takes a button. And the circuit looks like this. Uh, the buttons that I, I'm using, so these sort of momentary push buttons, are connected horizontally uh, on the, the short edge of the breadboard, so vertically on this breadboard. Um, so the, this, the two pins on the left are always shorted together. The two pins on the right are always shorted together. Um, and from the, the horizontal side, so from left to right, they're only connected together when the button is pressed. Um, this means you can actually have two circuits driven from one button. Uh, and so what we're going to do is connect pin 24 to one of the legs of the button. And we're going to connect ground to the other legs of the button. Now, I had to sort of cram my button onto the breadboard because it wasn't the right size. And that's why I didn't take it off before in my show me off uh, example. Um, to read from the button, we're going to have to configure it in a certain way. And so we need to configure the button as an input. It should be clear that we're going to read from it, so it should be an input. Uh, but we're also going to configure it with a, with a pull up. Uh, and what this does is normally, if you just leave a pin there, it will collect charge over time. And so if you read from something you configured as an input, um, what you would see is it would build up charge, and it would read as high, and then it would dump some of this charge, and it would read as low, and it would float around between these values. And we would call this a, a floating input. Um, what we can do instead is we can connect the pin to, uh, to a quite a high value resistor to either ground, uh, so a pull down, which pulls the circuit down, or to our power supply, which pulls the circuit up. The Raspberry Pi has some really uh, internal pull-ups that we can configure. And so what we do with the, the third line of the configuration here is we say we want to configure pin 24 to be an input with a pull-up resistor. And then if we list it back, it will tell us that pin 24 is an input with a pull-up resistor. And if this configuration hadn't applied, uh, these flags would not have changed. Once we've done this, when we read the GPIO and we're not pressing the button, it will say it is high. So it will say it is, it is at 1. Because when we press the button, we're pulling the uh, electrical signal on the, the pin to 0. And so this is inverted to, to what you expect. But it is quite a common way to set these up. Um, and so this is what we're going to do. And does this slide say demo? That's the wrong keyword. This slide says demo. Uh, Chrome clearly did not prepare for me 
switching presentations as often. Present now, my entire screen. OK, we're back. Uh, I have hidden that. And so we see the, the, the button is still, the LED is still blinking, but we can stop that. And it stops. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to add a wire to ground for the button and a wire to pin 24. If you bring up uh, pinout.xyz, you will see that this is pin 25, as I'm pointing with my jumper. This is a ground pin, so we're going to connect ground here. It did it itself, so it's fine. And then the next pin is, is pin 24, so we're going to connect this here. Plug it in. And I'll plug uh, pin 24 into one leg, and I'll plug my brown ground lead into the other leg of the button. And you can't see that. <laughs> now you can see it. Um, and so now we've connected this up, what we want to do is um, look at pin 24 and see how it's set up. Now, I was already using the system before to make sure things were working, and I ran the script that turned the LED on. Uh, so it's already configured. But um, what I'll do is I will do it again just to show you, because I'm a show off. Um, so we need GPIO CTL dash C to configure the pin, an input, and a pull up. And if we look at it again, we'll see that it's configured. And if we clear this configuration, so if we want it to be an output again, it, it's really straightforward just to, to clear out uh, and have it run a different way. So I'll make sure that configuration actually stuck. And so now, if I run GPIO CTL, at 24, it will tell us that the pin is high. And if I press this with my finger, we'll see that it's gone low. And so what we've done is we've, we've made a button that we can use. Um, but more interesting is to run the script that we have here, um, bus 0, because it's always bus 0, pin 24. And it will tell us that the button is not pressed until we press the button. Um, and, and that is the other half. And so that is what it takes to set up, a, set up an input. There is more in FreeBSD, so you can actually um, have GPIOs be real keys, so you can wire them to events. But I've, I've never done this. Um, there's probably some documentation for it, but probably not a lot. So if we look at GPIO button, nope. If we look at GPIO button, um, we'll see that it's almost identical to the GPIO um, blink uh, script that I showed before. Uh, it has some usage. Um, configures the, the button to be uh, an input and a pull up. And it has a function which, which reads and returns the status. And then it prints. Um, it prints button pressed if the button is pressed when the button is 0. And it prints button not pressed when the button's not pressed. OK. So I said at the start that the goal was to get, um, get us so that we could press the button and have the have the LED turn on. Uh, and, and that's where we are now. Uh, so I have a script here called GPIO lamp. It's not on my GitHub right now. I'm sorry. Um, it will appear, if I remember, to copy it off the, the Raspberry Pi. Um, and what it does is it mashes those two shell scripts together. And so it, it takes three arguments this time, the bus, and then the LED pin, and the button pin. It will configure the LED to be an output. It will configure the button to be an input with a pull up. And then forever, it will read the button. And if the status is 0, it will say the button is pressed and turn the LED on. And if not, it will say the button is not pressed, and it will turn the LED off. And that is all we need to make a very simple very simple button-controlled lamp. Now, I, I know that these might not seem very impressive. Uh, when you do this yourself, it is uh, so satisfying to see that LED come on. It's even better seeing it go off because you really feel like you've got control. And when you've connected things together like this, where you can press a button and have it do something, is great. Um, and of course, I have just written shell scripts here. There are no C programs. There's nothing complicated. Um, you could very easily connect this to uh, curl or fetch. Um, and so one of the examples I, I've talked about doing but never actually done uh, for the hardware hacking tutorial is a FreeBSD's, um, FreeBSD uh, build status monitor. And it would be very easy to add some more LEDs. Uh, that does have other problems because you end up drawing too much power. Uh, but add some more LEDs, and then you could say, like, oh, the ARM build's broken. And you can just follow this over time. And so this is the example that was published in the FreeBSD journal in 2018. 
Um, I wrote an article, Hardware Hacking with the BeagleBone Black. Uh, I've done a few of these. Uh, and that's what we did. We wrote something very simple, and it just spoke to the uh, FreeBSD continuous integration, and it told us if the build was broken or not. Uh, I'm going to put this back to blinking, because I really like blinking lights. Because everyone does. Uh, and I'm going to come back to the end of my slides. I want to stop presenting. OK, another demo that worked. Who would expected that? OK, and so just the final thing to cover is um, I talked before about expansions. And one of the coolest things, so if you are, are really inspired today and you're off to buy a Raspberry Pi, uh, what you'll find at any many online shops is that they sell loads of Raspberry Pi hats. And so these are add-on boards. Um, what you will find is that the Raspberry Pi hats are not supported by any of the distribution vendors. Um, they might end up with support by default but they're not actually supported. Instead, they're supported by the people that manufacture the hats. And so this picture here is the blinked shield from Pi Maroni. Um, it has some uh, APA 102 LEDs on it, so RGB LEDs in series, and we can individually address them. They're really cool, great for a status thing to have. Uh, so we can tell you what's going on with the build or the data center temperature. Um, but these are not supported by Raspbian. When you use these, you'll have to pull down uh, some Python library, or in the worst case, there will be a the worst case there'll be a kernel module you need. Um, and so, what you will find with FreeBSD is some of these things might be very easy to support and very easy for you to deal with. And so, this uh, Pymoni hat was okay to deal with for me. I I wrote some well, I wrote a shell script to control it on a on a stream because. Uh, I, I don't like doing things sensible ways, but it would be very easy to have some code that would, would show this. And I have a project idea that I'll, I'm sure I will get to eventually uh, to show some temperature sensors from around the flat. Um, but other ones of these, so I've had like e-ink screens that required kernel modules in Linux to use them, and these would be harder to support. But I would say buy, buy cheap things. If you're buying a Raspberry Pi from, from today or from some other, other thing, buy some cheap, cheap things, try and get them to work. It's a great way to get more involved in FreeBSD and to figure out more of the internals. It was taking a project where I had a Raspberry Pi controlling some locks for a mystery box. Uh, and I just wanted it to run FreeBSD because uh, it was much easier to deal with FreeBSD on the Raspberry Pi than it was a Linux distribution. Uh, and that's what, that's what led me to writing uh, kernel code so I could speak to SPI. And it got me doing things. And I think this is a great way into the project where you can make something to satisfy yourself. So it's very low risk, but you get to um, improve support in the operating system eventually, and you get to do something really cool. Uh, I'd I really like to, wrong keyword. Um, I really like, like to thank you for, for joining with FreeBSD Friday stream. Um, and I would like to say that the pies were, were pretty good and the raspberries were, were really good. Um, and so I, I'm happy to take any, any questions if you have them, Anne. OK, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. That was very cool. Um, we have one question. Uh, is there a list of hats which are supported? No. I, I really don't think so. Um, I, I, I imagine most people's experiences, they, they try and use a, a hat and it, it doesn't work. Um, but what you could do is, um, if you were interested in a particular thing, you could Google for the part number. Uh, what you will see a lot are um, small OLED screens that are in loads of stuff now. Um, you can actually drive those from FreeBSD, but you have to search for the Adafruit number. Uh, I think it's SDD1306. If you search for that, you'll find libraries. Um, one of them is written by Adrian, Adrian Chad. Um, and so there is support, because FreeBSD developers also like cool hardware toys. Um, we just add support for them, but a lot of them just languish on our, on our GitHubs. OK, and I also wanted to point out um, that uh, it was mentioned that in 13 current on the RPI4 firmware that the GPIOs have names. A lot of others, but um, they get them from the device re description. So just to an earlier point in your presentation. That's cool. I, I think I saw that one. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't tie them together. So um, anybody have any other questions? Well, if you do, um, you can always put them here, and we can tweet them out uh, to make sure they get answered. Um, or you can just ask us on Twitter um, as well. So. I will uh, hand this back over to Deb. Oh, wait, oh, another question. Hold on. 
Oh, more questions. Oh my goodness. All right, here we go. Uh, what other boards besides <laughs> Raspberry Pis are interested interesting for FreeBSD? Uh, so the the Beagle blown is really interesting. Um, what is what is really cool? I'm reaching for something. Um, okay, now I'm reaching for lots of things. So um, I don't know if you will see my camera. So the NanoPi Neo LTS, um, which Deb showed before, uh, is a great board. They cost uh, about 10 US dollars. Uh, they are 40 millimeters square. Um, they are more powerful than a Raspberry Pi. They have less GPIO, but they have better network. Um, they, they're, they're really cool. Uh, I, I really like them. I mean, I teach uh, a tutorial using them. So you can, you can tell I, I like them. And the company that makes them is really good and they support FreeBSD. Uh, other boards, so the, the BeagleBone Black, uh, which is here, is, is quite cool. Uh, FreeBSD support is a bit funny because it depends a lot on Linux support. Um, but a cool thing they have is, so this is the BeagleBone Black, and they also have a Pocket Beagle, which is much smaller. And if you're just going for adorability, this is great. Um, the thing about the BeagleBone Black is it has um, it has two real-time processors that, dri that can drive the GPIO. And so you can actually do quite high-frequency stuff with the GPIO on the BeagleBone Black. Um, other boards, the, the ARM64, stuff um so like the rock pi uh the system ownership which is in the pine book they have they have pretty good support um all winner boards have quite good support because all winner are very open with documentation there's a there's a ton of boards and maybe the easiest way is to look at the images we offer um and to look through the freebsd wiki because the freebsd wiki has loads of information about the boards we support and how to use them um and you could always uh find the bsd mips rc channel on efnet and ask what developers like, because some of these things are harder to support than others, uh, and the ones that we like get better support over time. OK, um, we have one other question. Uh, have you seen anything like a PWM for Raspberry Pi? I am not sure if you're asking about something specific. Uh, the Raspberry Pi has PWM hardware. There is not a device driver for the PWM hardware on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, uh, maybe there is, there might be. I, I know I wrote one, but I never finished it. I think PHK wrote one. I'm not sure if he finished it. Um, that would be a good question to, to, to ask in IRC. Uh, there is PWM hardware there. So the way that NeoPixels are driven from Raspberry Pis is uh, abusing the PWM hardware because the PWM hardware is actually very powerful. Um, I will say that most of the Linux code that deals with the PWM on the Raspberry Pis is writing directly into slash dev slash kmem. And so a lot of that code is actually portable to FreeBSD directly because it's uh, very, very tightly tied to the hardware. OK, another question. Is the speed in controlling the GPIO from assembly versus languages such as C or Python significant? Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. Um, you can manage a pretty consistent rate if the system is unloaded, but you get uh, quite a lot of jitter. So if you try and generate a, a square wave, um, I, I know I have done speed testing for this. There is a blog post by um, Gonzoat uh, where he documented uh, just toggling a GPIO. You can find it on kernelnomicon.com. Um, what I have done, so the, I'm trying to show you a camera that's not plugged in. So the, the blinked GPIO, um, the a, 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 APA 102 LEDs here, they have, uh, they have a clock line and data. Um, a lot of things that you can um, bit bang, so you can just write the protocol by toggling GPIO, they're, they're actually very generous in their timings. And so you can control these LEDs from a shell script. Uh, and so, you know, we're probably doing like 100 kilohertz consistently, but they actually, they just care about synchronization. The synchronization is fine. If you really wanted precise timing, I would get something like a BeagleBone Black where you have a dedicated real-time unit to do it. Okay. We have another question. Uh, how much RAM memory FreeBSD system uses of installed on board? Uh, I mean, let me... I mean, look. Um, so, th so this Pi three says it's got forty eight megabytes wired. Um, FreeBSD might be quite light. I mean, if you're if you're not running a graphical desktop environment, 
uh, there really isn't a lot on the system. And so it could be quite light. Um, the the older Raspberry Pis that have sort of 256 megabytes of RAM are okay, and I run graphical desktops on them, but they do struggle a bit because they don't have a lot of RAM. Uh, I imagine the Pi 4s with eight gigabytes of RAM are, are plenty roomy, and you're probably actually okay to do build world on them. Okay. I think that's our last question um, so far. Uh, if another one pops up, I'll let you know. Otherwise, uh, we can hand it over to Deb. <laughs> yeah, those are great questions. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, TJ for such a great talk. I um, I thought your ex explanations were really clear, and I love the uh, the pictures that you included. And with that detail, you could just really see what we're supposed to do to um, hook, you know, this the setup up. And uh, one thing to note to our viewers is that, so this was all recorded. And so that means you can go back and after we post it, uh, you can rewatch it and then you can follow along with um, you know, what TJ went through. And so all you need to do now is order like breadboard and jumper cables and, um, well, I have a, this isn't a Raspberry Pi, this is that Neo board that he was talking about. I have a bag of components here. And so you just need to get like this kind of thing and then you could do it at home. So, um, so, and the other thing that TJ, you mentioned was just like how you feel like you just accomplished something when you, you do something as simple as just pushing a button and yeah, turning on an LED. I mean, you just feel like you've done something. So that's awesome. So again, I just want to thank you. And, um, and so I want to let everyone know that our next talk is in two weeks from today. It's September 25th, and it will be an introduction to jails by Michael Lucas. So t stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll have this video posted in a few hours, and we'll see you in two weeks. So thank you, everyone.